good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome, everyone. I see we've got some people still logging on. Uh, welcome to today's uh, webinar session on opportunities for meaningful engagement and power shifting. Uh, we're thrilled to have so many of you online uh, and our wonderful set of speakers to discuss this important topic. Uh, if you go to the next slide. My name is Nandita Pante, and I'm with WHO and the IDP Network based in Geneva. I'm going to be co-moderating this today's event with a colleague, uh, Goodness O'Day. Goodness, want to say hello? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, and we are so excited to get on this conversation with you all. Thank you, Nandita. Welcome. Thank you. So before we begin, to go to the next slide, um, I just want to go over a few logistics for us. Um, today's discussion is really meant to be interactive. Uh, we purposefully not use the webinar format. We don't have slides. We really want to have an open chat, open comments, um, really create that safe and respectful place. Um, part of why we started this community of practice was really to create a safe space for a conversation. None of us by any means have any of the answers, but the idea is to create a space where people can discuss um, openly, honestly, and freely about some of these issues that we're all struggling with today. We do have interpretation available today in English and French. So if you're interested in uh, French or English, depending on the speaker, you can select the globe icon at the bottom of the screen. And finally, today's meeting will be recorded and we'll be sharing that on the ICFP site uh, or the IBP WHO site. So with that, I will turn it back over to my co-moderator, Goodness, to walk us through the agenda. Go ahead, Goodness. Thank you very much. We promise to have a very robust and engaging conversation. And um, these are some of the items we'll be running through for today. Uh, we have already welcomed you all and um, shared some of the logistics involved. Up next would be getting some overview of what the WHO, IDP, and HROP activity is. As you are well aware, um, this event is being hosted by the Committee of Practice, which is a joint collaboration between WHO, IDP, HRP, and ICFP community. So we'll get to learn more about them soon. Afterwards, I will be coming back to share updates about the ICFP Power Shifting Subcommittee, which I'm super pumped up to go about very soon. Then we will get into the business of the day. And that is when we have our amazing panelists who will be coming up to talk about how the work they are doing translates into meaningful engagement and also shifting power for equitable partnerships and engagement. And, um, after then, we would be hearing from you all. So please hang on till that time. We want to get to know more about your work and how your work also translates to meaningful engagement or some of the challenges you are going through. And very importantly, we want to learn from you. It is important that we learn from you and your work you're doing. And after then, we will be wrapping up the session and also providing updates on what you should expect from this community of practice and how you should stay engaged. Thank you so much. Super. Thank you so much, goodness. Um, we have a great packed agenda. As goodness said, I wanted to just spend a few minutes talking a little bit about WHO and IDP and sort of how we've sort of been working on some of these issues like many of you. Um, as hopefully many of you know, uh, IDP is a network of NGO and civil society organizations dedicated to supporting the dissemination and use of evidence-based practices in family planning and sexual and reproductive health. We're hosted at WHO in the Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health that also includes the Special Research Program, uh, HRP, the Reproduction Program. Um, and a couple of years ago, many of our partners, there was requested that we sort of do some sort of assessment about some of this language around diversity, equity, inclusion, decolonizing, localization, et cetera. And what we found was there was a lot of inconsistency with how people interpreted these terms. It felt very much like an agenda that was being driven at a global level, particularly in the aftermath of the George Floyd killings in the United States and others in Europe, other issues in Europe. 
And so, in fact, one of our survey respondents said, you know, it's almost like the decolonizing agenda has been colonized because none of us working at a local level are having a say into this agenda. And so we decided to go with that and have a webinar last year where we sort of took a historical look at these concepts of decolonizing, localization. Uh, we have a recording for that webinar available. You can put the link in the chat. And it really sparks uh, some, some really honest discussion, particularly from many of our local partners. Um, we took some of that work and turned it into this op-ed. You can see the, the picture there and you can share the link again in the chat. Um, and then that also sparked then some more work internally at WHO about well, what does this mean for research? And so our HRP, WHO HRP colleagues called, are in the process of holding a small consultation to really look at these concepts around decolonizing, uh, specifically around research. And so that's some of the work that's been happening um, at WHO and through the IBP. That was in, in, in parallel with some of the work that's been led by the ICFP power shifting community. And my colleague goodness will talk about that in a minute, but we decided to join forces to then host this community of practice. So I'll just say a quick word on the community of practice. You can go to the next slide. Um, and then I'll turn it over to goodness. But together with ICFP, uh, HRP, IVP, and WHO, we decided we wanted to create a space for dialogue and discussion, importantly on a neutral and sustainable platform. And that was one of the reasons we tried to use WHO because it's, it's a neutral technical body. Um, so the objectives are listed there, I don't read them. Um, and the goal is really to complement, not duplicate efforts, because there are a lot of groups working on many of these issues. Um, and we've been in touch with many of them. And again, the idea is to complement, not duplicate. And so one of the things we'd love to hear from you is what are you doing in the space? How can we join forces and complement each other's work? Um, as part of the community of practices scope, we wanted to organize some webinars. This is the first one. Um, and I've just put some ideas there. You can see thinking about organizational structure, donor priorities, local and diverse leadership, and the evidence. And these are some topics that have bubbled up to the top from our partners. But again, we're very open to hear from you. What, what would you like to see this community address in some of its work? So with that, I will turn it over to Goodness to talk a little bit more about the ICFP power shifting community. Go ahead, Goodness, over to you. Okay, I know, I know she's traveling and might not have the best internet connection. So what I'm gonna propose um, is maybe one of my other colleagues who are on the line from the ICFP might be able to give a quick update. Um, Amanda, can I turn it over to you to fill in? Sure, but I'm not as good as goodness is. So we'll give goodness a minute and maybe her internet will connect. Um, Hi all, my name is Amanda Burgess. I'm based in, in Columbia, Maryland. Um, I'm working with the ICFP Power Shifting Subcommittee. Um, we've been, since ICFP in Thailand, we've been kind of working together to continue to bring the community dialogue together um, and share resources um, as a part of that. So we've, we've spent some time and we will be spending a little more time um, on updating our website um, to include a resource sharing library where we're trying to sort of capture a lot of the things that our colleagues have shared with us um, at the various convenings that we've done in one place so that everyone can access those widely available resources like the great links from our colleagues um, at WHO and trying to Put, compile all of those into one place as much as we can to sort of share those out. We're also trying to organize and amplify upcoming events that are happening in the community. So not only ones that we're a part of, but also ones that um, our other colleagues are doing. I know we've got colleagues at the Time Initiative and a number of other groups that are that are also talking about this issue. You know, we're obviously, like Nandita said, not the only ones talking about it. Um, and we are not experts at this. So we're doing our best. Um, to kind of fill in and continue the conversation so that we're all learning together um, as we as we roll ahead 
We did host a pre-conference workshop um, on power shifting and advancing equity and research collaborations at the Population Association of America's annual meeting, uh, which was in April. And we had a great conversation there with about 25 social science researchers um, about kind of how we can be doing a better job at reporting back to communities um, and really, really working with and engaging with communities when we're doing research um, in those contexts. And so we, we had some really interesting learnings and discussion there. Um, I know our colleagues are here today from the Global Ro uh, Global Roadmap of Action group um, for young people. And so we're looking forward to hearing more about what's coming up at Women Deliver and this partnership with the Global Roadmap of Action um, to really talk about power shifting in the youth space. Um, and we do have an upcoming um, dialogue that will be a virtual dialogue um, at the Interdisciplinary Association for Population Health Science Annual Conference in October. But we are continuing to sort of explore opportunities to kind of partner and bring these conversations to other events um, that are happening in the space. So if you are interested in kind of partnering with us on something um, or anything else, please reach out to Goodness and I, and we would love to kind of talk more about what that could look like. Um, but I will hand it over. I'll hand it back to you. And Indita, those are kind of our updates. Um, and I'll make sure I pop the link for our webpage in the chat. Super. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Um, I think Goodness is trying to get back on. So we'll just hope that she can join us in a minute. Um, but I do want to keep us moving because we want to get to our panelists. I'm going to first introduce our speakers and then we will turn off the slides so we can see, see them and have the conversation. Uh, so our first speaker uh, panelist is Aysa Tafal. She's the director of PRB based in Dakar for, uh, for uh, Western Central Africa. Um, our next presenter, you can read her bio there. Next presenter is going to be Ernest Weissen. He's the president and CEO of Community-Based Organization Coalition in Malawi. And he'll be talking a little bit about the more the local context and what these conversations mean at a very local level. And our final speaker is Otuk William, uh, who's from Tanzania, from the Young and Alive Initiative, also involved in the IYAFP, um, a champion and advocate for, for young people and uh, sexual reproductive health issues related to youth. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I think what we'd like to do is sort of start, um, Isis, I will start with you and working for PRB and International INGO. We wanted to just maybe help, have you help us set the stage. Um, why, why is power shifting in SRH important and what does it mean in today's conversation? Um, and for those, and I think Isita, sorry, will present in French. So um, if you need to switch, Isita en français, qu'est-ce que ça veut dire pour le power shifting pour les discussions aujourd'hui? Donc si vous pouvez juste réfléchir un peu. Allez-y. Je vous passe la parole. Merci, Nandita. J'espère que je suis sur le bon canal. Thank you. I hope I'm in the right audio track for the translation, but thank you for... For the and before uh, starting, I just would like to say one thing that's really important. I'm I work for an international uh, ON, NGO, uh, PRB. I'm based in Dakar, in Senegal. Um, but that doesn't make me a local actor. That's what I want to say. We remain an international organization, and so I have this specific role of being uh, based on the continent where we work, and I relate with the headquarters, uh, PRB. So. Thank you really to organize this uh, webinar with interpretation because this is very not, uh, you know, frequent. And for those who know me, I've been really advocating for this, for francophone uh, actors to have access to uh, content in their language. Because, you know, in French, um, power shifting can be translated in many ways. It can be um, translated, I'm not going to, uh, translate all the nuances here, but there are many, many nuances. And depending on the context, uh, 
that we're talking about it, this term of power shifting has actually five or six meaning because it is very different to just shift power or to delegate power. Um, and this is very important because it relates to decision making mechanisms um, in a space that involves different types of actors with different levels of uh, decision-making power. So if we just uh, stay in our space of reproductive health, each of these uh, stakeholders have one or several very specific uh, functions or roles in the, in the reproductive health agenda. And these roles have evolved uh, since we've been working in the development space, and it continues to evolve and to change. So I will take, I will choose, uh, I will use power shifting as a way of, uh, and I, I'll conceive it as transferring, even though what I think what we really need is redistributing, but we need to simplify because in French there are too many words. Um, so this power shifting is not something that we can discuss um ignoring uh, that it's intrinsically linked to local um the local context so we're talking about redistributing uh, power from d uh, dominating actors to marginalized ac actors and marginalized groups. If we talk about marginalized groups in Africa, we're talking about um, really the groups that are really marginalized because some groups locally are also not marginalized at all. They, they do take a lot of dis decisions, but when globally we talk about uh, power shifting, we kind of of take about local as a whole and we don't really look at the different strata really of power and decision making so localization in um, development international development uh, refers to transferring uh, control, uh, decision-making power from external actors. So if I'm in Africa, I'll say external to Africa, towards uh, local organizations. So we always hear about transferring power, shifting power to local powers. And we emphasize a lot on local and, I'm, you know, um, it's we don't really know what local means really um, but we and put a lot of emphasis emphasis on uh, increasing capacity of local actors this is what donors want to achieve results outcome that maybe we'll define together so today and this is only my opinion I want I want to say this is not the definition for the whole sector but we are still uh, very defined by the donors to do, to choose those local organizations so we'll choose a country or a national organization as opposed to an international organization and I do have a very concrete example um, we work with an organization that is based in Kenya, there it's an African or organization. They have a regional uh, office in in West Africa. And the question that was uh, so this organization is called Amref. So um, the question from donors was: Are they an international organization because they are in different countries or not? Um, and they do not have access to the same funds for that uh, as a result of that. So for donors, Donors, the ambition to uh, shift power is it's it's inter it's more interesting for those local organizations that they're not defined as an international organization. So this trend has been increasing some sort of confusion in the past uh, six months, I would say, where donors are now saying we'll see on a case by case basis to whom we're going to direct this funds. Uh, so, if we are a first recipient of a grant and we want to redistribute um, a, a smaller grant, it's better, we've seen that it's better to select local or what, what actually local means 
They, it means uh, registered organizations that they're registered locally, and donors are not go, are not looking right now at how they've been created, what their story is. So, those concepts of local localization is quite complex, and and you know definitions is is. Um, we derive those, those, those definitions based on what we read, but in our day-to-day -day life, uh, localization, and, and again, I say, I talk about localization and power shifting as together because they're very intrinsically linked, but it, uh, so the, the idea is to transfer decision-making power to uh, to to a locally based organization, but it remains uh, sometimes in the international space, and we see um, we see that sometimes power is shifted to an organization, but internally within an international organization that who do have uh, local offices, which is very different from um, transferring decision making power and resources to organizations uh, that that have been created locally and, and sometimes what we've seen is that some organizations uh, who may not have had um, the time, the resources to build their capacity because they have their local label, they can have access to these funds. But for me, it's really important, you know, there is, a, it's important to recognize that there is a, a global trend right now. So we need to, to adapt to, to this. And we all um, recognize that it's being impact. It's it's impacting our way of working, our capacity to deliver activities in partnership processes that are changing. Uh, in the respect of protecting some, some, some balance, but today there is an acceleration that for me is a little worrying for uh, outcomes, for program outcomes, if it goes too fast. Merci, Aïsata, for your intervention. It was excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Aïsata, it was a great overview of sort of... Um, you know, the context of where we are today and the point that you make about definitions, what do we mean when we say local organization um, is really important. And it's a very nice segue to our next speaker, which is Ernest Weissen, uh, who has launched a coalition of community-based organizations based in Malawi. And for Ernest, for you, you know, I think building on what Isata mentioned, it would be great to hear from your perspective, which is a rather local network of community-based organizations, specific in Malawi. What does this idea of power shifting in SRHI look like for you at, at that very local level? And maybe can you offer some examples of how that power shifting has maybe helped or hurt some of the work that you've been engaged in, or lack of power shifting? has hurt some of the work that we've been involved in. So go ahead, Ernest, welcome. Thank you so much, Nandita. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, my name is Ernest Weisson. I'm the president and the CEO of CBO's Coalition for Human Rights and Good Governance in Malawi. And I also happen to be one of the pioneers for the establishment of this coalition in Malawi, which was actually established in 2018 and got registered by the Malawi government in 2019. And CBO's coalition was formed by a group of concerned CBO's representatives who saw the critical need for a platform for the voices of people uh, responding to the needs of the communities most in need in Malawi. That is. And since its inception, CBO's coalition has supported and continues to support the central of community-based organizations and the communities through advocacy, capacity building, and networking. That is across all the 20 districts in Malawi. And the CBO's coalition, when we actually starting in Malawi, we, we started with a handful uh, amount of CBOs, like 20 CBOs, but as I'm talking now, the organizations actually has grown, the association has grown to more than 1,300 CBOs in Malawi. Uh, we are an active member of, of the global movement for community-led community development. 
And uh, we are also happy to be the champions of the shift to the power movement in Malawi. Uh, we have come a long way from where we started. And today we are happy that we are now able to reach this far of initiating a shift to the power movement in Malawi. By partnering with over 1,000 grassroots, that's community-based organization, we are, able, we are shifting the power closer to the communities in Malawi, and we are proud of that. This way, we are not able to conduct, we, we, we are not only able to conduct human-centered and local red research, guiding in various engagements and programming, but we are additionally building mutual capacities as well. Uh, our shift the, power, shift the Power movement in Malawi strives for a more equal way of cooperation. It is a movement that requests top down with people led development, in which people determine for themselves what is important to them. After all, they are the ones that matter. Now, what does power shifting in sexual and reproductive health and rights look to us as, a local, as local actors? Shifting the power in sexual and reproductive health and rights will be about empowering local actors and people with lived experience to take the lead in decision making and implementation of sexual and reproductive health and rights programs. It will be about ensuring that the local actors themselves and their, and their constituents are not just passive recipients of aid, but are actively involved in the design, implementation, and evaluation of the sexual and, and reproductive health and rights programs. CBO Coalition is seeking INGOs and funders to translate these into concrete actions and practices. The INGOs can do this in many ways by adopting different practices of bottom-up decision-making, changing fund allocation systems, supporting participatory and local resource mobilization, reducing bureaucracy, redesigning policies and strategies, introducing flexible and long-term financing, including peer reviews, through the participatory planning and monitoring, and by organizing decision-making differently. Many INGOs and funders are increasingly incorporating co-creation processes into their work to build equitable partnership. However, not all co-creation processes are created equal. Local organizations and communities are rarely given a say in the design process, even when invited to consult on program implementation. We believe that giving communities voices should be more than consultation, but letting the communities lead. While some INGOs have responded to pressure to shift the power by re-evaluating their operation mo operating models and partnerships with local actors, not all have followed suit. On a sad note, we have observed some INGOs registered as local organizations just to access funding designated for local and national NGOs. And while also most of the INGOs and funders are relying on the national NGOs in the co-creation and design process, it's equally crucial not to sideline local actors and communities because it has become the practice of many national NGOs to fabricate proposals for funding without community input. Consideration of community interest usually comes after funding is secured. And in most cases, these considerations are, are nothing but tokenistic, where local communities have to feed supposed needs into a predetermined strategic objective of both a donor and the implementer. This failure to involve the community in determining the agenda at the initial stages of the project is definition and determination of success or failure. In some cases, external contracts consultants are called in ensure objective day and sanity in measuring performance and change of their programs. However, local communities are treated like specimen in a tube rather than active determinants of what change is or could be. Local communities know best what they need, so they should be in the driver's seat. By giving local communities the project lead, top-down programming is avoided and the community has received trust to develop and nurture their own actions and decisions. Working with local actors and people with lived experience will involve building their capacity, 
to take on a leadership role and ensuring they have the resources they need to carry out their work effectively. It will also involve creating an enabling environment that supports their work and provides them with the necessary tools and resources. Localization will improve the sustainability and impact of the foreign assistance and will ensure that local actors and people with lived experience are in the driver's seat. We believe that communities whose lives are most affected uh, by social problems are the best judges of the strategy employed to impact their lives. As I NGOs and funders seek to shift the power in sexual and reproductive health and rights, it should consider taking bold steps to truly transform the system as follows. One, I NGOs should commit to shift more leadership to, for priority setting, project design, implementation and measuring results to the people with lived experience and institutions with the capabilities and credibility to drive change in their own countries and communities. I NGOs engagement must become more inclusive, equitable and responsive to the needs, priorities and solutions, ideas of the communities most in need. Organizations and people with lived experience in the countries in which those NGOs work. These engagements will help elevate the voices of marginalized populations who have long been silenced. I NGOs should invest in local partners to build their own organizations, focusing on areas where they want to improve and grow and increase the leadership and authority of affected in determining how resources will be used within their communities to address their priorities and expand their family planning movements to increase access to contraception and achieve the SDGs. I urge us to co-design, implement, and evaluate sexual and reproductive, and reproductive health and rights programs with local partners and their constituents. Their knowledge, experiences, and opinions should shape the INGO's priorities and strategies. I urge should fully commit to increase opportunities for communities and young people, shifting power in its programs, governance, and influence and making sure they walk the talk of, of, of localization at every level. The IDGOs and funders need to look at the models of the global south, of local community groups that have been effective and learn how they have done it. We are also calling intermediary local funders. They should also focus on shifting the power and their role should be to administer grants to organizations and groups at the community level and relinquish their powers to communities to have greater control over determining where and how these grants will be spent. When INGOs empowers local actors and their efforts are responsible to local priorities, draw upon local capabilities, diverse networks, and resources that are accountable to local communities, they should expect that the results are more likely to be sustained by local organizations and institutions. We do recognize that INGOs cannot, on their own, drive lasting change in the places, in the places they work. Instead, their role is to support and catalyze local change efforts processes. I'll give you an example of the project which has failed in Malawi for not involving the local actors and the people with this experience. Like here in Malawi, though the country has a vision of reducing maternal mortality by 2030, and safe abortions still account for up to 18% of maternal deaths in the country. And it's the fourth cause of death among the pregnant mothers. INGOs and national NGOs have been lobbying for change and abortion for, for, of abortion laws for many years. And they've used top down approach to address the problem by engaging only the policymakers, members of parliament, and religious leaders to decide on behalf of the affected communities with very minimal effort to consult and make the people with the experience lead in the process. Hence, their attempts to introduce the termination of pregnancy bill has always been defeated, and there is no hope that it will succeed in the near future. And the government keeps on spending heavily on post abortion services. On the sad facts, member of parliaments have witnessed and assisted to bury pregnant mothers who have died because of an unsafe abortion, but they are not willing to help them save their lives by supporting the termination of pregnancy bill in parliament for fear of losing their seats in their constituents. But that they are happy to see them dying and assisting the bereaved families with coffee and surprise. 
Because by doing that, they believe that their assistance will bring a lot of votes for them come the next generation. The religious leaders as well also have been oppressing their members by making top-down decisions and rejecting the bill, by organizing protests and discouraging abortion debates among their members. The debate about abortion is not about right or wrong, sin or righteousness, as some assume. It is about how to save the desperate woman who wants to induce an abortion using toxic substances or dangerous objects. They have also witnessed and assisted to bury pregnant mothers who have died because of an unsafe abortion, but they are not willing to help them to save their lives by supporting the bill and yet they preach about love. We believe Thank that you. communities- Thank you, Ernest. I'm just gonna ask you, just wrap it up if yes. you can, just so we can get to O2 and have more of the discussion, but excellent. Yes, yes, exactly. I'm just Please go ahead, up. continue. Perfect. We, we believe that communities whose lives are, are most affected by social problems are the best judges of the strategy employed to impact their lives. Hence, the people with lived experience should be in the driver's seat so that they are not just passive recipients of aid, but actively involved in the design and evaluation of the basic character program. It is our hope that NGOs and funders can set the pace. Listen to national and community level stakeholders, especially women and young people, to inform their agenda and make bold, concrete moves, moves to demonstrate its seriousness to change. Real progress cannot take in another decade. Sure. Thank you so much, Nandita, for giving me a chance. Thank you. This. Thank you, Ernest. That was that was really, really inspiring. And we could feel the passion in your remarks and really some great concrete ideas of what INGOs and funders can do. I, I love some of your lines that, you know, co-creation is more than just consultation um, and the need for flexible funding and this idea of letting those with the lived experience really drive these agendas. Um, I think it's really important and certainly um, will help us launch some, some interesting discussion. I, I don't think many people are as familiar with the global, global roadmap for action uh, focused on young people. So maybe we could give a quick overview on that. All right, thank you. Um, so the global roadmap of action is a coalition of um, about 50 local organizations, mainly in the Global South, who came together to design um, a roadmap or a strategy that would guide meaningful engagement for adolescent and young people on sexual reproductive health and rights. Now, this came from the place of Mark the World Coalition. So um, these organizations from different parts of the world were working on this for um, a while, and then it was launched in 2022 at the International Conference on Family Planning uh, in Thailand last year. And what the Global Roadmap of Action hopes to achieve is to strengthen the work local organizations are doing and amplify it, provide support in different thematic areas to ensure that young people are taking the lead as it concerns their sexual and reproductive health and rights and then reproductive justice as well. At the same time, it is also to ensure that the priorities of young people are put at the core, and then these engagements are meaningful. I don't want to go more into what the meaningful part is because our panelists have done justice to it. Also, um, the Global Room of Action would be providing um, capacity strengthening to organizations who belong to the network and those who plan to join. And at present, we have an event coming up really soon in at the Women Deliver Conference. Um, members of this organization will be going through um, two days workshop, more like capacity strengthening, and also to hear from the coalition members on ways that the strategy can be more formidable and impactful to the realities of the over. Uh, the countries who are involved, right? So that would be happening. In addition, very importantly, the Global Roadmap for Action team would be having a conversation with the donors. This is like um, a side event happening at the Women Deliver Conference on the 18th of July. So I want to encourage you, if you are at the youth zone um, by 1 p.m. local time in Kigali, please come around and be part of that conversation and connect with the team. Another way you can engage if you would be at the Women Deliver Conference in Kigali is to 
come by the um, John Hopkins booths to learn more about it. I will be dropping a link in the comment section where you can click on it, read more about it, stay engaged, stay involved. And just before I wrap it up, I want to say the room is not, is not closed. So it is still open to young actors, local organizations who are driving change on sexual reproductive health and rights as it concerns adolescents and young people. Thank you. Super. Thank you, goodness, for filling in at the last minute. And there's some links in the chat where you can read more about this global roadmap. I think the reason we wanted to have that as part of this session was because it's a really good example of one effort. Uh, it's not a perfect, nothing is perfect yet, um, but it's an example of how groups are systematically trying to shift power, in this case, uh, to young people and local organizations led by young people. And that's sort of what we wanted to showcase with, with that. Um, we have about 25 minutes left and really wanted to have more of a discussion. Um, we heard some great uh, speakers really reflecting their passion. I think Isata gave us a nice um, overview of why this is so important now and still what are a lot of the challenges, even when it comes to things like definitions or translating some of these terms into other languages. Um, I think we still have a lot to do to understand really what we are talking about here. Um, Ernest really gave us some concrete actions and it was really impressive to see how much Ernest you've mobilized at such a local level in Malawi. And really there's a lot that we can learn from, from your group and you really provided some concrete ideas and examples of how um, some of this power shifting can be operationalized. And then finally, it was really helpful to hear more of the global action that was presented by Goodness. Again, just an example of how efforts are being made to sort of shift power. Um, so with that, I think we wanted to go to a discussion, which was going to be facilitated by Goodness, although I think she may have lost her connection again. Goodness, are you with us? I just got a note that her connection dropped, so. Okay, okay, <laughs> that's okay. So um, maybe I'll just fill in for her. This is really an opportunity for, we're, we're, we're a group, this is a safe space, as we said from the start, um, really want to have some discussion. So would love to hear from folks on the line. Um, what are you doing in the space? Uh, what have been challenges? What has worked well? Please feel free to type in the chat. Um, or if you have something you want to say to the group, you can raise your hand and we'll, we'll unmute you. Um, if you have any questions for our panelists as well. So let's just open it up. Um, Amanda, I, I see one hand I from Banchi. Banchi. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, goodness, you're back. Fantastic. Why don't you go ahead and facilitate? There's, yeah. Hand Thank up you from for just <laughs> coming in. Hi, Banchi. Please unmute your mic and share with us. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for all of you for organizing. I'm uh, Banchi Dasaling. I'm the MSI Reproductive Choices Africa Director based in Addis, uh, so sort of in a similar position to um, Asiata in that I am part of an NGO, but based here, born and raised in Addis uh, um, as well. So I just want to sort of um, really appreciate the conversation and the diversity of thought and the representation of folks from the continent on this panel. So really want to start out by appreciating that and I, I want to um, share a few points uh, within them, sort of uh, potential um, things to think about as we continue in this uh, journey and this conversation. So um, power, and I really like sort of the, the description of, instead of talking about decolonization or nationalization, uh, really focusing on power shifting as a really important sort of concept for um, for all of us to potentially sort of really agree that this is a better way to think about what this conversation really needs to be. Yeah, if we talk about decolonization, there is a colonizer and a colonized. There really is sort of, um, particularly what worries me is there is a victimhood assigned to those that work and operate and are part of the these national organizations or are based um, away from uh, global north sort of head offices. So I really appreciate the frame 
the framing of this conversation as power shifting and but really understanding that power is structural so when we talk about uh, structures that are built over decades and decades of funding a uh, particular type of funding or a particular type of um, ambition within the SRHR sector then when we want to change the power structure it's going to take time or should it take time or should it actually happen over two years three years it's one of the questions I would like uh, to hear more conversations about within the space. Um, from my perspective, I think one of the key questions I keep asking myself in hearing or uh, looking at reading uh, materials around this really is who's the what or who are the beneficiaries of a power shifting conversation within the SRHR space? Yeah. Honestly, um, is this about uh, really putting African leaders in uh, senior positions, or is this about um, something completely different? And I want to really say from where I sit, I think our purpose really needs to be, uh, we need to talk about power shifting as it benefits women and SRHR agenda on this continent, yeah? Any conversation that would hinder or take us back from ensuring access to women needs to be questioned. So I think um, if the sole beneficiaries or ultimate beneficiaries of this conversation is um, ensuring access to SRHR on, in a, on the ground to our communities, this inherently will uh, require that those that have closest understanding, as Ernest was saying, closest understanding of the issues, the finer points within the uh, dialogue around uh, be it abortion or safe abortion uh, or post-abortion care really should be leading the conversations. Yeah. So within that framing, there really is an ask for power shifting as well. Um, uh, with, uh, one more point and then I'll hand back over to you and then I'll type the other points within the chat. Um, I think one of the things I really would want us all to be cautious and really sort of echo um, echoing what Asiata had said at the start is who defines uh, power? Who, who evaluates and who says that these organizations, these entities are the right, have the right power or structure, yeah, are decolonized or nationalized, and therefore they should be the ones leading the agenda and getting the funding. Because if we actually say women are the ultimate, um, and uh, the SRHR agenda is the ultimate uh, uh, expected beneficiary of this, com this conversation. So I really would want us to walk away from having donors define uh, what uh, the right power structure is to deliver for the SRHR agenda on a continent like Africa. Um, I also want to say within that, this INGO, national NGO, I think it's a red herring from where I sit, okay? Um, and I say that because it disempowers a whole bunch of us that are uh, really committed to this continent, have always been committed to this continent, are pushing the um, agenda that benefits as we, as in our leadership, our African leadership sees fit uh, on this continent, it disempowers people that work within INGOs or it disempowers others working within, let's say, the donor community that really care about and know enough about what uh, would benefit uh, the SRHR agenda on this continent. So I think we need to really question some of these framings, particularly I, I'm quite against this INGO, national NGO sort of mentality because there are lots of Africans. I, MSI within Africa has 5,000 team members. Out of that, we probably have three non-Africans. Yeah? However, we are part of an INGO. And what are we saying? By saying uh, you're an INGO, my 4,000, 5,000 team members of this continent do not care about what happens to women on this continent. That's really a dangerous disempowering and uh, uh, lethal sort of definition to advance. So I'll stop there and put other points in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that very resourceful feedback. And I, I, I can't agree with you more. Um, we see that 
in many instances with power shifting and then local communities representation and teaming is one of the biggest issue in SRHR, right? And this is why this conversation is important and more importantly, what we hope to drive with the community of practice. We hope that the important points you raised um, would feed into continuous discussions we want to have through this community, resources we hope to share with our members of the community, which we also hope to get from everyone, right? And also um, ensuring that it is meaningful, it is impactful, and we are able to learn, take a step back, and maybe take some step forward as well as we engage on this. So thank you. I would be going to the chat box to read some of the feedback we've gotten from um, you all on this. There's a question, even though this question is not directed to anyone. Asata, I can see your hand up. I'm going to allow you to speak in a moment. Okay, it's down. Maybe that's a mistake. But um, I have a question in the chat box and um, Ernest or Asata, please feel free to respond to this. The question is, could you please elaborate on how marginalized youth populations like persons with disabilities are meaningfully engaged in SRHR programming? If the panelists have any insight on how their organizations are achieving this or resources from WHO, this would be greatly appreciated. Um, I don't know, Enes or Asata, do you have a minute to maybe give some example of how um, we are driving meaningful engagement of young people specifically living with disabilities and shifting power in that respect or useful resources? Asata, your hand is up, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to respond to this very quickly because I, I have no uh, concrete example, but what I want to say to this question or to a lot of things, and even to what Ernest said or some other um, perspectives that were shared here, um, I think in this specific on this specific topic about uh, sorry, je sais pas pourquoi je parle en anglais. Excusez-moi, je sais pas ce qui est mieux. <laughs> Pardon, je vais repartir oh, sorry. En, en français. I'll, I'll um, speak in French, sorry. So what I wanted to say is that I don't have any specific answer as to how we should significant, have significant, meaningful engagement. Sorry. Uh, but related to this, and uh, related to what Ernest said previously in this meeting, uh, regarding power shifting, and related to localization, we've heard a lot of things today about um, tra shifting power to local communities, local organizations. I'm, I'm sorry, you know, I've been working in this space for 30 years. I'm, um, I've been, you know, I've seen this being called local development or integrated development. You know, this is, I've been here around for a long time. Maybe you haven't even heard of these terms, but we've also focused on decentralization um, and it was always about local decision making making. But when we talk about power shifting to local partners, I'm, I'm asking, what do we mean in our countries? What is local? What does it mean to be shifting powers to uh, the, the countries where we operate? And, and regarding uh, youth engagement and community engagement, marginalized groups engagement, is this, you know, what I think is that this is democracy, this is about citizen uh, participation, and I think today, and this is why I'm talking about NGOs and uh, civil society organizations, 40 years ago, NGOs took a space in, you know, before there were not enough citizens that were trained, equipped to, to talk about all this, but now we do have civil society organizations who are very competent uh, in this space. So in the NGO space, if we uh, focus on the reproductive health sector, we, we can work, for instance, in abortion, but if I'm in Mali, I cannot work on abortion. Impossible. But civil society organizations can work and advocate for because international NGOs 
are bringing data and technical support to support their advocacy. So, so that's what we have today. There is a shifting of, of these international NGOs' role, really. Now they're more and more increasingly supporting uh, citizens' movements. And when I say that we should support community and engagement, really, we've been talking about that for 30 years. And this is our country's responsibility. I would not agree for someone to come in Mali and work instead of me to promote democracy, to equip youth. But, but today we do need uh, technical support and data from international NGOs to support those uh, you know, grassroots youth movements. So you know that uh, conversation about the northern country, you know, within our own countries, we also have some issues, the same kind of issues on uh, shifting powers between generations. You know, we... Um, we, it's, it's been challenging to position youth voices local in, in our country. So this is why I'm saying we should really look at our role and uh, what it is today. And this is very related to these questions on, you know, how do NGOs, who, and particularly international NGOs, how do they know exactly what's happening uh, locally in terms of decision making? In international NGOs, especially those who are not uh, francophone or European, uh, who do know in West Africa, who, who knows decentralization uh, processes, who knows what that means for youth and in what space youth are able to bring their uh, perspective and, and data. There are actually official uh, consultation frameworks and that that is a way for them to have an impact on um, on policy making and what I, you know, I think we should support, we generally globally want to support locally, but sometimes we don't even know what mechanisms are there already. So I'm wondering who, who benefits, who does it serve? Because as an in international NGO, we have a, a funding issue and, and and the idea of working with in-country partners, you know, it's not about delocalizing power, it's about relocating power. And so we do have to have concrete examples, but I think the core of the issue is that locally, where where who has the money really to create what spaces for dialogues are we focusing on uh, in country partner organizations I, I do think that we should not, um, you know, talk about local development generally if we, if we do not look at what the roadblocks are concretely on the ground right now. Merci beaucoup, Aisata, and um, I hope that that provides an enriching response to your question. I want to also encourage you to check the chat box. Nandita has shared resources from the WHO and uh, members of the IVP network where you can find useful resources that um, speaks to engaging young people with disability meaningfully. And I also want to add that when we talk about engaging young people who put across different um, sectors and disparities, it's important that we see them as equal partners. Usually, for people living with disability, we understand the stigma that comes um, with them, and that is one huge um, gap that needs to be overcome. So I would say that it's important that in, the, in your engagement with this group, we must acknowledge that they have useful inputs to bring to bear about their issue, their, their problem, and they are equal partners on this, right? We, all, we already know that disability is not 
um, doesn't make them incapacitated or that they cannot contribute. So we must respect them. One biggest tool I feel with the past shift in engagement we've had is listening. So it's important that we listen more and then we prioritize their need. And at the same time, we already know the challenges that comes with um, the different groups. So we must be willing to make um, the necessary adjustments to accommodate people living with disability. We already know that many institutions, organizations don't have the infrastructure to accommodate them. So those are some of the shifts we should be looking at when it comes to engaging people living with disability. And young people specifically also have unique needs as regards SRHR and um, in this, in, this, um, in this demographic. I would give room for a few other persons to speak, but I want to plead with you to keep your comment or your question to one minute at most, because we would love to wrap up our session really quick. I see two hands that is up. Himan Suhan has been up for a while, and then Grace Ibo Han has been up for a while. But very quickly, I just want to appreciate Esther Ayuk, who tells us about the work she's doing at C-Y-J-U-L-E-R-C. I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that in full, where they are promoting the application of the abortion law by courts to enable conflict affected women and girls to assess safe abortion care and SRHR services within health facilities. So thank you for sharing that important work you're doing, Esther. We would appreciate if you can share maybe um, a link or some way to learn more about what you're doing. So the community of practice can always um, exchange ideas and learn more from you. I also see some feedback from the um, response we got from Banshi, acknowledging that it's important that we have that representation from young people. There should also be intentionality when it comes to who is representing um, the population. And we also remember that the most important thing is um, the priority of the community and that the SRA child need is um, is, is being addressed to those groups. So thank you so much for um, amplifying Niha. I also see um, Esther um, adding to that saying, shifting power is absolutely the right conversation to have. It removes victimization of some groups of people, um, colonizers and the colonized. Thank you. So I'm going to give um, room for Himansu Basu. Please forgive me if I'm pronouncing your name wrongly to so please share with us. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm Rotary International. Uh, I just got a slightly different viewpoint. Instead of power shifting, why can't we talk about power sharing? Because we are an international NGO, we're also local, regional. So within my one minute, I can just say that there are a lot of other resources also than funding. We're talking about advocacy, we're talking of technical support, digital support, including artificial intelligence. So if we do that within our Rotary, and this is my last message, if you like, I'm nearly finished with a minute. We, are, we would like to have alliance at a global level. Uh, if you like, it's a kind of um, hub for support with like-minded people in RMCA, the Productive Maternal Child Health. We like to have a tactical platform and I'm, I'm also involved with the royal colleges of obstetricians, midwives, pediatricians, et cetera. And thirdly, and importantly, at the country level, we should have a local organizational lounge. We all meet together. So let's come out of our silo, see where we coalesce and why can't we work together uh, in support of a solidarity. And this will abolish this myth in you know north south solidarity in rotary we do programs nobody is is there in charge we're all together work so is it possible to work together thank you so much and you are absolutely correct as we acknowledge that there is um the gap and the dynamics that comes with power we also need to acknowledge that we need to share power. And I absolutely agree with you. The goal of the power shifting discussions and the many power shifting engagement going on in um, different countries, communities is to achieve shared power, shared prosperity, equitable engagement. And I am so glad that you're able to amplify that. Very key, we have other non-financial resources that we can leverage on as we close the gap when it comes to um, 
power structures and power dynamics. And we would love to learn more about what the Rotary International is doing in this respect and resources you can share with the community of practice. Feel free to reach out to us. I'm going to give room for Grace Ebo to share her thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Grace Ibo, and I'm speaking to you from the University of Calabar in Nigeria. Um, so what I want to share with the community of practice and um, charge the community of practice to do from my experience working in a tertiary institution is the fact that um, the youth participation in um, the whole SROH landscape is very low in tertiary institutions. And we have a large population of young people in tertiary institutions in Nigeria. And if we are not able to um, critically look at this critical mass of young people within a system that can be so organized to also um, bring in their strengths, their energies in pushing the agenda um, forward. Um, I think um, we are a little bit late, but um, it's not bad um, to engage. Um, if we want to engage, for instance, in Nigeria generally, we can engage um, through the Committee of Vice Chancellors of Nigerian Universities. Um, these institutions need to understand why they need to pay attention um, to the needs of SROH needs of young people in the schools. Um, for instance, in the University of Calabar Youth Friendly Hub, I have a lot of young people coming to demand for SROH services, especially family planning commodities. And there are no systems and ways of um, the university understanding why these commodities have to be brought to the youth friendly hub, for instance, or why they need to go for them without waiting for maybe an international partner to bring those services um, to the school. It's really important that we engage this critical mass of stakeholders because they are responsible for millions of young people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for bringing the very important group of people that issues on SRH care impact and adolescents. I am glad to have worked with Ms. Grace Ibo um, as an alumni of the University of Calabar community and the amazing work she's doing in Nigeria. And I can very much say that when we are programming or designing SRH interventions for young people, let's remember that it's also something called working with young people, right? And um, NS has said it more than enough that it's not just about the consultation, it's also through and through engagement. I see that we are doing a lot of terminologies around what we really want to achieve. Is it power shifting? Is it power sharing? And um, I also saw another word recently, um, power reclaiming. So those are like interesting terminologies and we all envision for the same goal, right? There has to be a shift in power before we can share power. The powers that be who are holding strongly and are unwilling to share must recognize that it's important that we share that power. And at the same time, you can't just wait for the power to come to you. You must amplify your voice, you must make your case and then we reclaim the power. But let's keep in mind that the goal is not to, it's not for strife. The goal, the goal is not to replace the other. The goal is equity. The goal is a world that works for everyone, shared prosperity, a world where we feel that we are equal partners and contributing to making the world a better place for everyone. So we hope that um, through today's conversation and ongoing conversations we'll be having, um, we will get richer insights and richer resources. I see wonderful point that has been raised in the chat box. We acknowledge you, we thank you. And my time is up, so I have to hand over to Nandita now. Thank you so much for engaging in this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, goodness, for facilitating the discussion and to all the participants for, for your honest comments, feedback, remarks. This is what we wanted to do is create a space for people to be open and share. Let's, let's challenge each other in these conversations. Um, really quickly, before we wrap up, uh, just a reminder to please join the community of practice if you're interested. It's a place where we can share resources, 
um, whether they're webinars or documents, articles that you come across, whatever it may be. If you signed up for this webinar, there was a question asking me if you are interested. So for those of you who marked yes, you'll automatically be added. If not, you can join with that link on the screen. Uh, goodness mentioned the events that women deliver. So please do, if you plan on attending those, that conference, please join that. And I mentioned earlier, we hope to have a series of discussions like this one in the coming months. So do stay tuned. And if you have ideas or are interested in hosting and leading, please reach out. This is a platform for all of us. Goodness and I took the lead for today's, but we fully intend on shifting the power, let's say, to others in this community. This is a space for all of us. So with that, I will turn it back over to Goodness for one closing poll and just any last words that we might have. Go ahead, Goodness. Did you have that last poll question? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, great. So this last poll question, um, I want to encourage everyone to just engage and you just have to put your response in the chat box. Are we ready? So yes. we would like to know, how do you feel about today's conversation? Please feel free to be as honest as possible because one thing that we keep in our um, power shifting um, discussions and engagement is to ensure that it's honest. So please share with us in the chat box how you feel about this conversation. If you want to give a one word, if you want to give a phrase or a sentence, we would be in the chat box looking out for your response. Just really quick, in the next um, few minutes, we should be done with that part. And just a really quick uh, extra thank you to our panelists for your passionate presentations. It was really inspiring to hear all of you, Isata, Ernest, and goodness. Uh, Otuk, we heard some of your, we got some of your feedback in the chat as well. And to our interpreter, Awen, thank you so much for, for making this accessible for a larger group of people. So with that- Thank you so much. I can see wonderful comments. We can see that it's been insightful, it's been informative. We love that it's been meaningful for you all. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.